G'day Year 11, uh, Society and Culture. Welcome to another video. Um, as always, hope you're well, um, staying safe and healthy. Um, what we're going to do today is look at in detail, and we're going to do this over the next few lessons as well, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, um, is we're going to really dissect socialization agents. Um, so remember that's things like things that influence how we grow up, things that are helping us form and shape our identity. So we've got things like school, your family, peers, the media, the government, all those sorts of things. Um, we're going to break them down each sort of lesson. We'll do one or two. Um, and that's going to really help us understand this concept of identity formation. Um, so as always, I need you to get your book, syllabus pen, concept cards, and the whole works um, ready to go. And we'll, we'll jump straight into it. Okay. So this is lesson five. Um, our dot point today, if you get your syllabus up, is on page 31. And if you go fourth dot point down, um, you'll highlight the influence of each of the following on the development of personal and social identity. So highlight that, that's the fourth dot point down. And then immediately under that, we're just going to look at family and kinship today, um, which is the little dash just below that. So highlight that as well. Remember to make sure you date it so you're keeping up to date on where you're up to. When you've done something that way, if you miss something, it's pretty clear that um, you know what you need to catch up on. Okay, so here we go. Without further ado, so make sure if you haven't already, you're on Google Classroom. You've opened up Lesson 5 slides as well to accompany this. Um, so get that open now. We'll start on slide 2. So again, you've got your subheading there of family and kinship and your three paragraphs of information. Please get those down. Um, your notes are so important to get, especially in your um, senior years, because when you're gonna go back through and study, um, ideally what you can do is make a summary after each notes, um, especially when you get to year 12. And having it all in the one place that's central in your book that you've also handwritten yourself is, is one of the better ways to retain that uh, information. So here we go. Family and kinship. As you're writing this, I'll sort of dissect it and explain it as we normally would in class. So when we're looking at socialization agents, now again, remember socialization is a process of how we're learning to become functioning members of society as individuals, right? We're learning all the key rules and roles that we're sort of um, supposed to perform. We're thinking about as well how gender might affect that, how social constructs around that might affect it, our sexuality, all these different things. Um, but in terms of what we're focusing on today is family. Now they are probably arguably the most important socialization agent um, that anyone has and the most influential, um, especially when it's forming your identity. If you think to when you're, um, when you're born, your parents, um, you know, they, they, they've literally created you and brought you in this world, right? So they're, all their beliefs and values, they're raising you up um, to the best of their ability and according to what they think is sort of the right thing to do um, by you. And what they're wanting, obviously, um, as parents is the best for you. So what they're trying to do is raise you up so that you can function ideally. This is just um, my view and sort of the parents that I've spoken to, um, is that the best thing they can do for you is to raise you up in a way where you can become fully independent, um, where you can become a fully functional member of society as socialization process decrees. So in doing that, what they're doing as you're growing up, they're shaping your core values and beliefs, um, which is obviously based off and influenced by how their parents have raised them as well. Um, and from a super young age, you're, you guys are really impressionable. Your minds are growing they're like you know i've already said this in class they're like sponges they're just absorbing information so the amount of change of your identity you have as you're young during your formation years um so from when you're born up until about 18 is sort of the most pivotal time um each of those have their own different stages but especially when you're quite young um we looked at last lesson how you sort of start to when you're younger you mimic behaviors of your parents rather than um, making your own mind about it. 
not, not your own mind up about it later. So when you're younger, you're mimicking their behaviour. That's why a lot of kids play those games with, with dolls or things where they're sort of mimicking what their parents do. You might see a lot of kids um, nursing babies and they have like those baby dolls. Again, they're trying to mimic that um, that behaviour and that role model. But as you get older, obviously your mind develops, you become more socially aware and cognitively aware of your surroundings and you then see them as choices and possibilities as opposed to trying to mimic that behaviour. Um, so your family definitely has the biggest influence on that. Um, you've also got it's not just your parents, it's your interactions with your brothers or sisters, so siblings if you have them, um, aunts and uncles, extended family, you've got grandparents and, and um, cousins as well can be significant depending on the, and they might not be significant if your family um, isn't that close, but all of those interactions um, are really sort of vital in shaping your identity, especially when you're younger. Um, so the sort of importance I'm trying to get across the family and kingship is that they're pretty much the primary socialization agent. They're the first ones and definitely probably the most important and influential to most people. Of course, it's not for everyone, but for most people, I would say um, it definitely is the case. In terms of how the family structure is set up, typically in Western culture, you may have heard the term nuclear family. You've got mum and dad, two kids. Um, it's not just about the numbers, that nuclear family sort of stereotype. It's also about how each member of that family has very defined social roles. So if we're looking at um, traditionally um, and conservatively, you've got the father who is the breadwinner, which means he goes and earns the money and works, from, works out of home. Um, conservatively and traditionally, the mother... Um, performs the domestic roles and duties, looking after the kids and, and raising them. Um, and then the kids are sort of, you know, they're going to school and they're sort of fitting their gender stereotypical roles as well, as is traditional conservative. Now in today's society, contemporary society, families, that's sort of what it used to be like. So if we're looking at continuity and change, how things have stayed the same or changed over time, a lot of those traditional roles still exist with families. And that's okay. That might be the case with yours. It might not be but it still exists. But what we're seeing today in the change aspect is that across time, a lot of, um, and that's a reflection of our society and beliefs and things, but we're seeing a lot more of blended families come through. Um, so by blended, I mean, you might have two mums, okay, you might have two dads. You might be living with grandparents, they might live with you. Um, you may have foster siblings or may be a foster sibling um, yourself. You may have adopted, you may have, um, a family that's not all white and Caucasian, okay, it might be a blend. You may have multiple ethnicities sort of in your family. So the um, fathers might be the stay-at-home dad, mum might be out working. Po both parents might be working. That's really common today. Um, so what we're seeing today is that socialisation agent, how does that reflect and change it? Well, it changes the sort of traditional role and setup of it. So over time as that family unit has changed, so will its influence on our socialization process. So that's sort of that slide two sort of talked about. Um, I, th I guess the main point is just understanding the really important pivotal role that family plays um, in the socialization process. All right, moving on. Slide three, I've got two questions for you. Okay, so I want you to copy them down and answer them in your book. So, and I'll just explain what they are. So question one is, how might family size impact family life and socialization? Okay, so I might talk a bit about what I mean by that. So in terms of family size, I'm, I'm literally thinking, um, are you an only child or do you have like five siblings? Do you have two, three, four? Um, is it a single parent or is it two parents, whatever the case may be, I want you to hypothesize how that family size could impact family life in general. So that might be as simple as getting a bigger house that has more bedrooms to fit in everyone, same as a car. Um, it might be that if there's less siblings, you can get more one-on-one -on -one time with parents, whereas if there's more, you might have less of that. But you might also look at 
that as an advantage or disadvantage, but we're getting into that a bit later. So I just want you to generally and broadly sort of say how could family size impact family life and socialization? Okay, so have a go at that. Question two, this is where I was getting into that sort of tail end of what I just talked about. So I want you to list the advantages and disadvantages that you think of growing up in a family in regards to the following. One, as an only child, so I want you to look at the pros and cons you think of growing up in a family where you're the only child, okay? So like I alluded to before, advantages might be you have more one-on-one -on -one time with your parents. Um, because they're not paying for, you know, five kids' sporting activities, there may be more financial and economic um, interest, I suppose, coming your way. So there's more opportunity for you to do um, different activities you might not be able to do in a larger family. Um, disadvantages might be something like um, not growing up with siblings, not having those um, interactions with them that can shape really strong, positive lifetime memories um, and things like that. So that could be sort of a pro and con of a having an only child. Um, when we're looking at with a sibling of the same gender, I want you to again apply that same question. Pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of having a sibling with the same gender. It might be, um, and this could be depending how you view it, you know, hand-me-downs, um, the economic burden of that would be less if they're of the same gender. Okay, I, I used to get hand-me-downs all the time. Um, disadvantages is you might fight um, for certain things. Advantages is that you might um, have more common interests um, if you're of the same gender and things like that. And then the last one I want you to compare it to is of more than four children. So think of a big family. What are the sort of advantages and disadvantages do you think of that? Okay, so answer those questions in your book. After you've done that, move on to slide four. And I wanna talk about this idea of the politics of birth order, right? So I want you to sort of think about, there's a lot of, within the family dynamic and the family group, and in terms of how people internalize their roles in the family and their identity, there are certain sort of stereotypes when you look at the youngest child, the middle child, the eldest, um, and things like that. So this is all about politics of the birth order, right? So think about the youngest child. Now this is, in terms of my family dynamic, we, we talk about this all the time, and it might be the same with yours, but there's a common um, consensus that the youngest child is spoiled and that they get away with everything, right? Is that the same in your family? Do you agree or disagree? There's a question there for you to answer. Um, even even the fact that the youngest, let's say if you're the oldest in the family and you had to um, wait a certain amount of time before you could watch a certain TV show or, or go out with your friends alone without, you know, your parents' permission, all that sort of thing, if you found that the youngest, say... The age bracket for you as the eldest was 13, but you found that the youngest child, by the time they were 10, they're allowed to. You might scream, oh, that's not fair. I had to wait till I was 13. Things like that. So does the youngest get away with everything and is spoiled? I want you to have a look at that. The second one about middle child, so middle child syndrome, um, is something I'm really passionate about, being a middle child. So what I want you to look at, again, in the politics of birth order is... If you are the middle child or you have any experience or sort of understand what that term is, if not, I'll explain it now. So the middle child syndrome is sort of like the in-between um, of the family. The, the concept is that they're, they're constantly um, left out. They're not given as much attention as the oldest and the youngest because they're sort of that middle kid, right? They sit in the middle of the pact. Um, all the rules of the eldest and the youngest seem to apply to them as well as the disadvantages. Um, or often they feel like it's only the disadvantages. So say, for example, you're not allowed to stay home by yourself because you're too young, but you're old enough to accept responsibility for certain actions where the youngest kid wouldn't get in trouble. Things like that. I want you to think to yourself, do you think middle child syndrome is real? And I want you to explain your thoughts on that. The third and last one is our firstborns. So kids that are born first, so the eldest. Do you think they're what, and this is what my family coins it, as the golden child um, or the favourite. So you might think, oh, you know, because they're the first kid, um, they get the most rewards, they get away with 
um, a lot of things that other siblings wouldn't do. Um, the parent sort of idolises them more than the other kids. So I want you to look at that politics of birth order. Do you agree or disagree that firstborns are the golden child? And then lastly, question four, I want you to sort of analyse your own family makeup and, and try to figure out where you think you sit in the politics of birth order. Are you the youngest, the eldest, the middle child? Are you none of those or you sit with a blend of a few? Um, I want you to sort of think, does that description that I've just given you match your role within the family? Yes or no, why, why not? Okay, so have a go at that. Um, and that's it for the lesson. Um, the summary task is essentially the same as question four. So you can do that instead or just do question four and that'll be fine. I'll leave that up to you. Um, that's lesson five. So that's just a bit of a deep dive in family and kinship and how that affects um, our personal and social identity, but as well as sort of they're really important um, as a socialization agent, being the primary socialization agent, um, affecting your morals, values and beliefs more dominantly in most cases than any other. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you stay safe um, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. Peace.